that's really a great pleasure for me to be here for, for Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, who was my advisor. And uh, I would just want to, to tell you about two, two stories where he, he was very, very influential for me. So maybe um, I will speak about uh, Fitzler Laplacian and then about critical exponent of projective, uh, projective uh, structures. Well, uh, it's a special year this year, it's about Lagrange. So when I came just to, to see him, I was very interested in uh, calculus of variation. And as uh, a member of Arthur Bess's uh, team, he immediately gave me this book, Metaphor Rules of Geodesics. All of those geodesics are closed. And uh, tell me, you, you should try to understand the geometry included in this equation of variation. It's, it's what I did for, for many years. So. Uh, Thank you to Robert Bryant. And this morning we had a discussion about Finsler geometry, Finsler geometry with indicatrix and the manifold, and uh, maybe some trajectories. And uh, this will stand for the same thing as a unit tangent bundle, if you want. It's a bit different because when you want to put several metrics, you prefer the homogeneous bundle. And the equation that was written this morning <coughs> for geodesic equation is that you have a vector field which is uh, the vector field with flow, uh, with flowing the, the geodesics above. This morning. This morning. This morning it was E. That's right. X was E. I yeah, X was E. Yeah. And yeah, but A, A is now the contact form. Yeah. So I'm in the smooth case, but I will leave the, the smooth case uh, soon. Though I X is a red field, so this is classical things, and A is a Hilbert contact form. OK, uh, we had discussion for, for years about uh, finding a Laplace operator in Finsler geometry. And uh, there has been several attempts. And this morning, uh, again, Robert told us about uh, Legendre transform. But Legendre transform is not uh, linear. So if you want to transport gradient, compare gradient and the differential function, then you get something which is not linear. So the not natural way to, to create a Laplace operator, you get something which is not linear. <coughs> so the idea, I mean, really was a discussion with Jean-Pierre. He told me one day, OK, if you want to have a Laplace operator, think <coughs> you make a sum of differential second derivative, partial derivatives. But instead of making a sum, do the partial derivative in any direction and make an average. Then you get the usual Laplace operator. So the question was with respect to which measure we could make the average. Okay? But the idea is very simple because you have a contact form. So you have a contact volume above. You have the fibers, the space of directions. You have the fibers. So you have the conditional of the measure. So what you do, you make the integration and then you get the Laplace operator. It was written first for the first time by uh, Thomas Barthelme, which was one of my former, former students, PhD students. Well, I can't resist to uh, continue in the way of Yiming. Let's consider a cat auxiliary metric. What are cat auxiliary metric? You consider, for S2, you consider the, the, round, the round sphere. This an ocean, a round ocean, with some stream, exactly what's happening. You have a drift of the trajectories. And you keep only two closed geodesics. Only two closed geodesics, the equator in one direction and the equator in another direction. Well, if you write it a bit more properly, then it's a killing field V, the stream. And then you add two Hamiltonian. The standard Hamiltonian plus an epsilon. And using Legendre transform, you go back to the Lagrange set. And it was quite a surprise for Chen and me that we discovered independently that these are re non-reversible Finsler metric of curvature plus one in, in the sense of flat curvature, these metrics. And they have only two closed geodesics. In which, which case, when, when epsilon is irrational with respect to pi. OK, so I asked my PhD student, to, can you compute the spectral data and at least find the lowest eigenvalue? He did that. He got lambda 1 with an expression very easy, 8 over pi over volume omega. What is volume omega? The volume with respect to the contact form. So he got that formula for this metric. Let me recall you this Hirsch theorem, which is well known in the Riemannian setting. And compare. It means that this matrix, they fulfill the Hirsch, the Hirsch theorem. Something should be done, but uh, it's still 
has to be done. <laughs> okay, so a very short story because I have 10 minutes. Second story. A second story, which is in the vein of Jean-Pierre, study the geometry of the equation. So let me recall, if you take a surface or higher dimensional object, closed for the moment, I restrict myself, you want to have a projective structure. So you take charts, you, you map them locally into RP2. When you have a change of charts, this is a restriction of an element of PSL3R. When you go to the universal cover, then you have the developing map. The image of that, of the universal cover of the surface, is nothing else but, in that case, a strictly, con a strictly <laughs> convex proper open set, omega. You have seen one this morning for Hilbert geometry. And in the same time, what you get very interesting is that you get a representation of the fundamental group of the surface into SL3R, not SL2R as usually, SL3R, higher representations. And the idea is that you have a group. Can you say something about this group? For instance, can you say something about the critical exponent of that group? The critical exponent is the exponent which is linked to the Poincaré series. The Poincaré series diverges if you take something smaller than that. Okay? It counts the growth of the group. It counts also the number of uh, closed geodesics, smaller than a certain, uh, of, uh, uh, shorter than a certain number. So, as to one of our former students, could you compute this? And he said, yes. Yes, we can do it. I will say in two words why. The number of the, the, this critical exponent of the group is also the topological entropy of the group. And it's less, in, in general, it's, it's here and it's two. But in general, it's less or equal to n minus one. Well, in the, uh, for the Riemannian surfaces, it's not so, uh, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, but it is, you have equality. So if you go on the Teichmüller space, you have equality. This number doesn't change. But if you go to projective structures, real proje projective structures which are not Riemannian, then it's strictly smaller than n minus 1. To understand this, well, I don't say much more, but you have this omega, this set, and you have a group acting on it, whose quotient is closed manifold. But if it's Riemannian, then that's a conic. We know everything. If it's not Riemannian, by Benoit, we know that the boundary is not C2. So if it's not C2, I cannot compute the curvature as usually. I mean, there is no uh, Riemannian metric well defined on a unit tangent bundle. But, but, using the ideas of geometry, the idea is that curvature is something you get when you go along the trajectories. Because the trajectories of uh, Hilbert geometry are straight lines you can go along the lines. So you can compute everything, and what you get, the curvature is minus one. So I complete the list of this morning. There is a huge, a huge space of manifold of curvature minus one, but not in the smooth category. There are C1 plus epsilon. And this is truly a diamond, because you, the spasm of, of, of this is, uh, as dimension for surfaces, eight times the, Euler, the absolute value of the Euler characteristic. What is embedded in it is the Teichmüller space. And uh, uh, what is the key ingredient? The key ingredient is that is ve that's very surprising. So you have the same curvature. So you say, OK, I sit down. I'm familiar with Jacobi equation. It works. And I, know, I understand everything. But in the Jacobi equations, you have two ingredients, the parallel transport and the parallel transport and the curvature. But the problem is that the parallel transport is now is a global object. It's not metric. It depends on what you see at the boundary at infinity. <laughs> and it has Lyapunov exponents. So you change the Lyapunov exponents. So you change the entropy, and you get some information. And you can go further, only due to this parallel transport. So this was uh, very interesting to have the geometric inside. And uh, I want to finish and say thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, for that good ideas. But you just explained how, uh, just by 
saying a few remarks. Uh, Jean-Pierre has been very influential on, on his work. And it, in fact, we didn't talk too much about uh, what we intended to, to say uh, on these very short talks. But I will tell you a story which is quite similar. Uh, well, the difference between Patrick's talk will be that there will, won't be much mathematics in my talk because I wanted to, to stick on the human side and uh, to speak about uh, how Jean-Pierre uh, supervised students and how this was uh, very important in my own work and in my own way of uh, trying to do something in mathematics. So, um, the, when I began my PhD studies and my PhD work under Jean-Pierre's supervision, I was struck by the fact that physics was very important for him. And probably that was uh, one of the things that uh, was attracting me when I went to, to ask him uh, if uh, I could be his student. And, well, I was lucky enough that he accepted. And uh, when I began, uh, the, one of the first things he suggested was that I should look at the problems uh, in mathematical general relativity, and especially questions related to the mass of asymptotically flat manifolds. So uh, to understand my story, I should at least say a few words on what here are these things. So the context of my story is uh, the realm of asymptotically flat manifolds. So asymptotically flat manifold is uh, the way physicists describe an isolated gravitational system. So it's just a uh, Riemannian manifold and very roughly speaking. Riemannian or pseudo Riemannian? Riemannian. And forget about, about the Lorentz and Sam. Take Riemannian. Let's make the thing simple. <laughs> and uh, you just assume that the complement of a compact set is deformorphic. to the complement of a ball in Rn, and then you ask conditions on the metric, and you, you just assume something like Gij minus delta Ij <coughs> behaves like, well, R, the geodesic distance in the Euclidean <coughs> space, to a power minus tau for some tau, which is strictly positive. And then you can also add condition of the same type on derivatives of the metric. Okay, and so this is a rough definition of an asymptotic flat manifold. And the special feature of this kind of manifold is that, in fact, this is a definition in coordinates, but whenever you take another chart of this type, so let's call this one psi 1, and then you have another one psi 2. And we just assume that you have the same kind of estimates on the coefficient of the metric. Then you have this special feature that there always exists an isometry, an Euclidean isometry, such that psi 1 composed with psi 2 minus 1 equals the isometry plus some remainder, which is decaying to 0 at infinity. So in fact, it makes sense to speak about the limiting Euclidean metric at infinity. So it's a, it's a well-defined geometric notion. OK, and then, so this phenomenon has been remarked by a number of people. Uh, uh, Robert Bartnik, Jacques Crucial, maybe even Jacques Ebrouillard. And mass is a very important invariant of uh, Riemannian invariant of asymptotic flat manifold. And this, um, well, the surprising part of uh, the, the very improving fact uh, of mass is that it's, it's an invariant defined by we using first derivatives of the metric. So here is the formula. You have it's defined this way. You take the limit as the radius goes to infinity of an integral over large spheres of something which is G 
ij d, well, let's say i g i j minus d g i j i times the, co the coordinates of your unit normals. And of course, you sum over i's and j's. Wait, wait, what is the i? What time the you believe? In coordinates. In coordinates. But then it depends on the actual coordinates. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so wait a minute. And, and if you are a Riemannian geometer, this looks completely crazy. This looks completely crazy because all, every Riemannian geometer knows the motto of Riemannian geometry. The motto of Riemannian geometry is there is no content in the no geometric content in the first derivatives of the metric. But the difference here is that we are around infinity, not around a point. And it turns out that this makes sense. So this integral exists, but not only it exists, but also it has geometric content. And moreover, it, it, if you compute this integral in any of these charts, and if the tau here <coughs> is large enough, then you always get the same number. So it's a remaining no, variable. Unlike when we oscillate, you know, just, you know, because they want to leave you there, just for one variable, not the initial one, you said. They're meeting some condition you want to do, no? Maybe some of Einstein equation. Yeah, no, 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 no. no you, well, the, the precise condition are that you need this calculator to be L1 and tau. Ah, still equation no one. Okay. I didn't say, okay, okay. It's in, but, but it's just a decay condition at infinity. No, but it's in it. It's a very strong condition. Really not strong. so strong. No, 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 but otherwise it's not true. Otherwise it depends uh, on oh, what yes, it, it, is what I'm saying. For, there are some conditions. Sure. No, there, there are some conditions. For instance, if tau is... You need second order condition. Otherwise it's not true for one way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You need the second order condition. Yeah. Right. Sure. That's the way. And then, if you want to prove that energy is independent under these conditions of the choice of the, of the chart, then you just, it's just a computation. And then something which is, well, maybe you can call it uh, miraculous happens because you do the computation, so you have n psi two of g and then compute the difference between this and m psi 1 g. And then, well, you do it explicitly. And there are a lot of terms which are very nice because, of course, it's given by limit. And there, are, there is an integral, of course. And then there are a lot of terms which are OK. They go to 0 at infinity, as the radius tends to, tends to infinity. But there is at least a series of terms which has no reason to go to zero. But then you look very carefully at how these terms, how they are organized, and then you realize that these are divergence of something. So they just cancel out because you integrate over spheres which are compact closed manifolds. OK, and this is the context of my story. And then uh, I was beginning my PhD studies. And one of the first questions Jean-Pierre asked me was, can you try to explain this? And I was struck by this question because I believe that there is, this is a really very nice question, not the precise question, but the way we mathematicians can use physics to do mathematics. Because you have to really look at what is behind. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I didn't solve that question. <laughs> but it turns out that I like this question very much. And so, many years later, I began to have PhD students myself. And so I had the habit to ask them all the time the same question. And it turns out that one of the PhD students did solve it. So let me give just his name. So his name is Benoit Michel. And very unfortunately, he stopped doing mathematics. 
but he found the answer. And in fact, he proved that you can do exactly the same kind of construction for a very, very general, uh, in a very, very general setting. So in fact, this works uh, for a very, very large class of uh, invariants. And let me just say a few words. I won't um, explain too much because I don't have the time. And I know that Usama is eager to talk. <laughs> But the idea is that whenever you have a natural differential operator, let's say phi, uh, from the space of metrics, and it can be even larger, in fact, uh, into the well sections of some bundle, some vector bundle over the manifold, then you can do this uh, very simple thing. I'm assuming that if you compute this capital phi to be the metric, it's zero. And then you do this. You, you, do it, you just perform a Taylor expansion. So you start by writing this. Take an asymptotic flat metric and compute phi of g. And then, of course, you subtract zero, which is capital phi of the Euclidean metric. And then you write the first derivative of the capital phi, computed at the Euclidean metric, applied to g minus the Euclidean metric, and then, of course, there is some remainder here. And then, this is with values in the sections of the vector bundle. So you take the scalar product with some section of the vector bundle. and integrate over the whole manifold. And here, I'm just explaining the thing formally. So you have to add the, every uh, check on convergence and so on. So, but I will just hide this. And of course, you integrate. And then you integrate by part here on this part of the formula. And what you get is here, you get the other term, the one you expect, so that's v phi star of v against g minus the three metric, plus something which is a boundary contribution. So something which I call, well, let's say, u of v and g. Plus. Sorry? It depends on phi, you know? Dep yes. Just finishing like this. And then the remainder. Too. OK. So that's the main formula. And now the, this is the explanation of the construction of mass. Because the idea is that you consider v's in the kernel of d phi star. And then this construction here gives you a map from the kernel of V4 star to the reals or complex, if, the, if this is a complex uh, vector bundles, whatever. And this is an invariant of the same time as the mass. And in fact, it doesn't depend on the choice of the chart. And the reason for that is also included in, the, in that formula. It's just another simple computation. You just have to look at the dependence of this thing here on the chart. The dependence on the chart, it comes from the fact that you have here a reference Euclidean metric. And when you, when you change the chart at infinity, you get another Euclidean metric, which is the same at infinity, but if, you're, uh, if you are at finite distance, there is a small difference, which goes to 0 when you go to infinity. So you have to look at the, the way this thing varies when you change the Euclidean metric. And it turns out that the important thing is to look at this u of um, some v in the kernel of phi star times, and you want to differentiate this u with respect to the Euclidean, the background Euclidean metric. So what happens here is that you find terms like the derivative 
of the degree metric in the direction of any vector field. And you want to, to say something like this. Uh, and then to get contact with this formula, the natural idea is just to take a divergence. Then you find again the integration by parts. So you get something like here. Uh, no, sorry. So I have the V, V phi of this thing plus minus V phi star of V and then K. But still, V is an element of the kernel, so this one is zero. And remember that have said somewhere here that phi the Euclidean metric is zero. So this here, since phi is a natural differential operator, this is indeed the variation of phi for the Euclidean metric. So it's zero two. Okay. So you have here, this U, it's a map, it's a natural map from, the sec from sections of vector bundle, it's X, into closed forms. And moreover, it's very easy to see that if X equals zero, then U of this thing. Okay, and then there is a nice, very nice theorem, which is due to Robert Wald, which says that whenever you have a map from section, from natural map, from sections of a vector bundle into closed forms, in fact, and such that the image of the zero section is zero, then it has values in exact forms. And you're done. Because the fact that this divergence here is zero, this means that this U is a divergence. So you do exactly the same computation as the one I had done a few minutes earlier, and it shows that the any construction of that type, if this thing is non-zero, then it's a remaining invariant of the SMW flat manifold. So thank you, Jean-Pierre, for asking the question. Uh, so let me start with the following claim. This is not the well-known claim we heard, we heard about this this morning. Spinners and there are operators are uh, powerful and diligent tools uh, in mathematics and in physics. So this is uh, something Jean-Pierre uh, told me at the beginning when I started to work with him, that he heard this from Lichnowitz in 79 and Sir Michael Atia. So then there were some subclaim of this fact, which was my thesis uh, work. And this was Jean-Pierre's uh, subclaim. Uh, the, uh, this was about conformal covariance of the Dirac operator. Conformal covariance of the Dirac operator <coughs> should uh, should be. Uh, relevant to study specific uh, problems, uh, geometric problems. And he had a precise problem in, in mind. This was the Yamabe problem, which was, which uh, aimed to say that when we work in a conformal class of metrics, 
then we can make a special choice of uh, the metric in this conformal class, making this character virtual constant. Yeah. So, in fact, I was not able to to prove this fact, but I I uh, really tried to uh, make use of the of the conformal covariance of the Dirac operator, which men was mentioned this morning by Sir Michael. This was. Uh, uh, Nagelnitschian uh, cont contribution to prove that the dimension uh, of the space of harmonic spinners is a conformal event. So uh, we have we heard about some uh, it's a nice formula which we usually call the Schnallis formula, but uh, one should say that Schrodinger in 32 and the Schnallis. in 1963 uh, proved a very nice simple formula and I want to in fact to write down this formula in, in the case of compact manifold with boundary and so uh, for, um, for a compact manifold so this is what has been called the Buchner formula by Misha so uh, I don't want to define the, the I mean, the whole thing, so let me write down this formula. So if you integrate on, over a compact manifold M, so let me write this uh, R for the scalar curvature, 1 over 4 R psi squared plus nebula psi squared minus D psi squared integrated against uh, dm. So what, what all what are these uh, objects? So that is this is the standard Levi Civita connection, which is coming from the, the uh, Riemannian manifold, and D is the Dirac operator. R is the scalar curvature. Which was S in the talk this morning. So the, the, the schrodinger lishnowitz formula, if we take a manifold, the compact manifold without boundary, this is zero. Schrodinger actually wrote it, yeah, how? Uh, schrodinger wrote a paper uh, in 32, in fact. He worked locally and he found this formula. He said, this is a beautiful formula, but he was not able, there were no index theory to conclude that. I mean, what Lishnowitz has done afterwards in 66. For Riemannian manifold, the road for Riemannian manifold? No, not for Riemannian manifold, locally. But for potential, it's potential problem. Yes, but I mean, the formula is really written. Uh -huh. And uh, this was, yeah. For general so, metric? Yes. In the Lorentz and Lorentz, etc. Uh, and this was uh, unlike Hotman who found this uh, mm -hmm. in, in a Polish uh, journal. Uh, so uh, what I want to, to do today is to say, okay, okay, we have seen uh, this morning, we, we, have, we have seen that if you are imposed, if you have a compact manifold with a positive scalar curvature, <coughs> then the kernel could not be could not be zero. The kernel is empty, is zero. Okay, but well, you can just treat it on this. And now, in fact, if we uh, if we consider a compact manifold with boundary. Then I'm going to write the boundary term and to define some appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, uh, boundary value conditions so that we can also look at this term carefully and to, re to relate this to the mass which has been defined by Mark just now. Okay, so, so this is uh, nothing but the integral over sigma of d psi psi. I will de define this. Uh, uh, data minus n over 2 h psi squared. h, you can imagine that uh, here r is a double the trace of the, the curvature and tensor, the r here. Because zero. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> we'll see. But what I want to do is to put this inequality with under some conditions. But now it's no more zero if the uh, manifold has boundary. So, uh, in fact, uh, on a Riemannian manifold, if, if I take M to be, if I consider M to be a, a Riemannian, 
steam um, compact manifold, then we have the spinner bundle uh, SM. <coughs> this is a spinner bundle. And the drop operator acts on sections of the spinner bundle. Uh, if we uh, take now uh, a sigma and consider sigma to be the boundary of M, so then we have to look at uh, the restriction of this spinner bundle to sigma. So I define S slash sigma to be the restriction of this ambient spinner bundle to sigma. So in fact, here, uh, if what, what should I should assume, maybe take n to be n plus one dimensional. So then, sigma is n dimensional, and this extrinsic, extrinsic spin bundle of the hypersurface of the boundary is nothing uh, is is uh, isomorphic to the intrinsic spin bundle of sigma if n is even. So let us stick to this case. So the, then there is some identification. This. But n is even. When n is even, yeah. Which is an interesting case when n is equal to n. So here, so what is d slash? This is the extrinsic Dirac operator. And also, it is isomorphic. It corresponds to the Dirac operator, to the intrinsic Dirac operator of sigma. H, as for R, this is the mean curvature. This is a trace of the constant of this. Second. Exactly, if we operate equal to intrinsic or the differentiation normal direction of how to do it. For Dirac? Yeah. No, it's, it, it really corresponds to the, to the intrinsic Dirac operator in, the, in this case. In, if anything, if not, if you have the double copies of, of the intrinsic Dirac operator of the boundary. Yeah? So now, now with this uh, beautiful formula, let me uh, express uh, in some uh, appropriate boundary conditions so that we can control the sign of the boundary term. So here, as we have seen, uh, if I consider, so the, the, here we have, uh, say, M, And the boundary sigma, I take n to the b, to be the, the, no, no, the normal uh, vector field to sigma. So if we consider gamma n, gamma n is Clifford multiplication by n over s sigma. Then the, the uh, as we defined when we, the about the spinners. And Clifford algebras is this idea of square roots of minus one or minus identity. So gamma n square is minus identity. If we, if we are, uh, look at i gamma n square, then this is identity. And this will give us uh, projections, orthogonal projections, to, in such a way that we can, uh, for any phi in sigma, uh, in S sigma, phi will decompose into phi plus plus phi minus. But so that they equal, because you have this H term, they become equality. Without H term, it wouldn't be equality. It's not true that external equal to internal. Okay. External equal internal plus H, right? Not not yeah, okay. L let's well, stick to, yes, let us stick to the external term. It's, 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 it's scale the term. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. So now we, you see here, uh, I, want, I would like to uh, put some conditions on R and on H so that we can get some conclusions, uh, for, for example, the sign of the boundary term. So, the intrinsic now, the intrinsic on the boundary. No, uh, he, uh, no here we, we, we can leave it extrinsic. Just extrinsic or intrinsic? Extrinsic, extrinsic. This extrinsic. Yes, we keep it like this. So here, if we assume that R is non-negative and H is positive, okay, these two conditions. So then uh, I look at this 
uh, eigenvalue problem, eigenvalue boundary, uh, sorry, uh, boundary value problem, let me write it this way. So for, for any phi in gamma S sigma, there is a unique phi in gamma S sigma solution of the system. Deep psi, this is the uh, ambient uh, Dirac equals zero on N, and psi plus equal phi plus on sigma. Okay? <coughs> so now I use uh, this solution of this system. I, uh, I look at it in this boundary term, and I, uh, there's, uh, it's not straightforward to show that using the properties of these uh, operators, and this is less or equal than 2 over n integral over sigma of 1 over h d phi plus, this is phi plus, because phi plus is equal to phi plus, squared minus n2 over 4 h phi plus squared d sigma. OK, so this is uh, straightforward, but there is uh, some trick we, 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 we show that we have such inequality. Under these conditions, if R is non-negative, this is non-negative. And with the C being solution of this system, we get to prove that this is non-negative. So this term here, for any phi, for, for any phi plus on the boundary, um, S slash sigma, we have uh, this inequality. So this under this condition, you always have this inequality? Yes. So this you can, you can forget. Then. I can forget everything. Now we have this. So what we do, can conclude, we can do, uh, do the same trick with the other projection, projection to the negative uh, part. So then we, what we get is that this is also true. So we add up these two inequalities. That these two terms are non-negative. The sum will give the fact that 0 is less or equal than an integral of 1 over h d uh, slash phi squared minus n squared over 4 h phi squared. This is do you have a numerical factor, no. n2 or n? Uh, Straight out. Here, no, no. It's, it's, it's really here. There's a, there's a trick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I can show you. I can explain this. But this is just, uh, I control some square, which is not zero. Uh, so here, so what we, in fact, what we can say that for any phi, if we know that the square curvature is non-negative and the mean curvature is positive, then we have this fact. So what's now, I come back to the conformal covariance of the Dirac operator, which says that this is exactly integral over sigma of uh, d bar uh, <coughs> h. I would say what I mean by this, phi of h norm squared minus n, over, n squared over 4, uh, phi h squared d sigma h. So I have to explain what I mean by this notation. So here, I take the conformal metric, I multiply by h, h squared the Riemannian metric on the, on the manifold or on the boundary, which so here, we, that's where we need h to be positive. So, if we, so here, this is the Dirac operator associated with this conformal metric. So now, we can say, we can, we can see that this uh, phi of h is in fact h to the power minus n minus 1 over 2 times phi. So here, we have many results which we can read on this inequality. Say here, for example, we can say 
that the first eigenvalue of this operator d slash h is at least equal to n over 2. n over 2 is the first eigenvalue of uh, the Dirac operator of the sphere. And if we have equality, then we have phi is a restriction of a parallel spin -off. This is very restrictive. And also, we can get back to this information here, and we can uh, conclude, I will just finish with this, if, if sigma is, moreover, uh, being, sigma is in, uh, under these two conditions, R is non negative, H is positive, and we, if uh, we have an immersion in some spin manifold M0 uh, of dimension M plus 1 with a parallel spinner, uh, and sigma uh, H0 being the mean curvature. of this immersion, then what we could conclude uh, is that uh, I mean, because of the Gauss formula for spinners, when we have a parallel spinner, then it, get a, a, it, it gives a, a kind of uh, eigenspinner. This is, uh, uh, so what, it, what we, we have, if, if lambda psi is uh, zero, then we have d phi equal n over two, H zero phi, if I take this immersion, okay. So here, if we make such a choice uh, in in this second in, in the first uh, inequality, then what we get is that integral over of H square H, H zero square over H minus H d sigma is uh, non negative. So this is a kind of holographic principle for parallel spinners, which says that now sigma has been, is, is being the boundary of a spin manifold with non-negative square curvature, and if at the same time sigma is, an, immer is uh, an immersion, the immersion should be, I was not very uh, precise, uh, this immersion should be either spin. That means the spin structure on sigma, which uh, we get by restriction here, should be the same as that from them. Then in this case, we have inequality between, we have such an equality. And in case we have equality, every uh, parallel spinner on M0 gives rise to a parallel spinner on M itself. And if we have many parallel spinner, uh, spinners here, well, this is the characterization of the Euclidean space, then uh, the manifold itself is an Euclidean uh, space. Okay, so uh, before I start, I would like to thank Jean-Pierre Bourguignon for really sharing with all of us his insight and his taste of math for mathematics. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Are there any questions concerning the three lectures? Uh, yes, for the second lecture. Yes. So, so, uh, about mass, and so the general formula is about some invariant expression. Yeah. Which invariant expression you apply for the mass? Uh, but if you want to get the classical construction for mass, you take just capital phi to be the scalar curvature. Scalar curvature, yeah. Uh, well, I have a question from both the slides. Two. Thank you. Uh, this looks very much related to Witten's work on the this is exactly uh, inspired by Witten's work, exactly. But just in instead, you, you, as yeah, as you noticed, if you if you complete if you complete the, the picture, then that's what uh, Mike has uh, discussed. Then this is he, he, the boundary is the sphere, and when you take the limit at infinity uh, of the boundary term, it's this is the mass. It's really sketchy. Exactly, it's really inspired by Witten's proof. Any other questions? I have a comment. Yeah, I just uh, voudrais simplement remercier toutes les personnes qui sont déplacées pour les conférences d'aujourd'hui. J'espère qu'ils ne sont pas déplacés 
pour moi vraiment, mais plutôt pour les conférenciers qui étaient tous des personnes exceptionnelles. Euh, je dois dire que j'ai été euh, très touché qu'ils fassent tous euh, l'effort de venir ici. I was very moved that you took the pain and uh, also leaving uh, where is he, it's over there, to make this short trip for, for this conference. I really appreciate that very much. And uh, I'm, uh, well, this uh, two days, yesterday was an uh, official uh, um, ceremony of uh, going from one director to the next, which was also some kind of a uh, special experience. Uh, I must say that the idea of this conference comes from uh, Emmanuel Hulmo, and I'm extremely thankful uh, to him for having the idea of uh, not only uh, doing the administration, but thinking of uh, my own science, which, uh, as you can imagine, has suffered quite a lot from my being a director here, but uh, that's life. One has to make decisions from time to time. And uh, I hope I can uh, recover from, from, from this. Uh, Some of you know that my recovery may be short, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think um, I'm going to Stanford for three months. Uh, I was very kindly invited by um, Yasha and Yashberg, and I'm sure I will enjoy that very much. I have to give a, a course, which uh, the topic is not yet fully chosen, because I understood that some faculty members want <coughs> me to talk about the rack operators, the other ones want me to talk about the Ritchie curvature, so they have to make up their minds and <laughs> follow their advice. Thank you so much for having come, and uh, everybody for the organization, and uh, all the speakers for the wonderful lectures. Thank you so much.